Hello, good evening, and welcome. Welcome to our second Longwood Seminar of 2011, Living Long, Living Well, Aging with Flourish. I'm Gina Vild. I'm the Associate Dean for Communications and External Relations and Chief Communications Officer at Harvard Medical School, and I'm delighted to see so many people here tonight. Can I have a quick show of hands if you attended our first Longwood Seminar? Wow, wow, a lot of repeat visitors. That's fabulous. Well, we're delighted. And we do know that people who attend one or two, they tend to be repeat attendees. They come back for more, so we're thrilled to know that. This year, I want you to know, we relied on our Facebook friends to determine the topics for this program. We posted about 12 different topics online, and many of you here in the audience likely voted. And this program that we're offering tonight was by far the most preferred topic for this year's Longwood Seminars. So there's a lot of excitement around this issue. There are two seminars left for the year. March 29th, From Vision to Touch, Exploring the Five Senses, and April 12th, Food for Thought, Genetically Modified Nourishment. So now a few quick announcements. You've heard this before since most of you were here last week, but we are videotaping and we will be posting this online, which is pretty exciting because not only will your family and friends have an opportunity to see it, but it will be viewed around the world. The HMS website has phenomenal reach in countries internationally. So this has a lot of potential in terms of who will be seeing it. So if you don't want to be in the video, I've never seen anyone move, please move to the back of the room because you may inadvertently wind up on the video if you're sitting in the front. If you attend three or more seminars, you can receive a certificate of completion. If you did not receive yours from last year, you can pick it up in the lobby. If you attend all four seminars, you will receive professional development or continuing education credits and forms are available in the lobby. And finally, turn off your phone. Although I have to say, in the, all the years I've been doing this, I've never heard a ringing phone. So this audience is, is very good about that. So thank you. Um, tonight's seminar is called Living Long, Living Well, Aging with Flourish. We all wonder how to find that elusive fountain of youth, how to unlock the secrets that will lead to a long and healthy life. Bookstores, <coughs> excuse me, Bookstores have volumes dedicated to the topic. Informa inform infomercials abound. You could spend years of your life literally web surfing content that holds the promise to turning back the clock. I'm pleased to tell you that the path to rejuvenation may begin right here tonight as you listen to three individuals who are internationally recognized for their expertise on the issues of aging. While, while we would all like a quick fix, we also need to understand what happens biologically as we grow older. So tonight, I want to welcome three extraordinary members of the Harvard Medical School faculty who will share with us not only their wisdom, but their research. Tonight's guests, let me welcome them. Dr. Jurgen Bludow is Chief of Geriatric Clinical Services and Director of the Center for Older Adult Health in the Division of Aging at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Bludo is also an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. You will also hear from Dr. David Sinclair, who is co-director of the Paul F. Glenn Laboratories for the Biological Mechanisms of Aging and professor in the Department of Pathology at Harvard Medical School. But first you'll hear from Dr. Brent Forrester. Dr. Forrester is director of the Mood Disorders Division in the Geriatric Psychiatric Research Program at McLean's Hospital. He is also an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. So welcome and thank you for being here. Hi everybody, thanks so much for coming tonight. It really is a pleasure to be here. Um, as mentioned, I'm, I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, which means that I, I see and take care of older adults who have emotional, behavioral, and cognitive issues as they, as they get older. And our, my motto, at least, in taking care of patients is thinking about the positive aspects of aging. What can we do to improve mental health as we get older to sustain our cognitive functioning and to stay active and healthy? So I, I want to sort of give a positive message to tonight's uh, series of lectures. You'll be hearing from two 
terrific experts after me. I'm going to speak just for a few minutes uh, and then introduce these individuals. And then we'll have a, a fair amount of time at the end to have an interactive dialogue with questions and answers. So I think everyone knows that I, I hope everyone has index cards they can fill out. There'll be people to collect them. And then I'll be uh, going through them and, and getting your questions answered. All right. So what I thought I would talk about in my few minutes is to actually talk about really an epidemic of aging, which is Alzheimer's disease. And the reason I'm bringing, up, bringing this up is because the sheer numbers of people who are suffering with this illness in this country is increasing steadily with the aging of the population. How many in this room were born between the years of 1946 and 1965? Great. And how about before 1946? Yeah, so it takes up almost the entire room. So the first category with the baby boomers. The first baby boomer turned 65 on January 1st of this year. And these numbers, which are from the Alzheimer's Association, are about 5.3 million Americans with Alzheimer's disease. And this number is supposed to almost triple in the next 20 to 30 years. And I just read today that the amount of time that caregivers spend in caring for individuals with Alzheimer's disease, there are about 15 million caregivers in the United States spending about 17 billion hours a year in caregiving and costing society about $200 billion a year. And that's today. So anyway, uh, one, of the, one of the downsides to this illness is the fact that we really don't have any easily recognizable targets to quickly identify and diagnose this illness. It begins very gradually and it's often hidden from, from plain view. And so about half or more of the people aren't even diagnosed with this illness until they reach the moderate stages of the disease, when they've already developed significant memory problems to the point where they really can't drive anymore, they probably can't function at work anymore, and they're having difficulty even managing around the house. So early diagnosis is critical. Um, the, the illness, uh, this comes up all the time when we see patients. Uh, I've had family members say to me, well, you're telling me that my mom has dementia. At least it's not Alzheimer's disease. And um, if you look at this definition, what you realize is that dementia is, a, is, is, our, is our term for a broad category of disorders that includes a decline in memory along with one of these four other things. So impairment in language function, so not getting the right word or saying the, right, the wrong word for, for an object or a person a difficulty with motor function, which we call apraxia, a difficulty recognizing familiar objects, animals, people, which we call agnosia, and then a broad term, which we call executive functioning, where people have a difficult time with making decisions and planning and organizing their day. And we can make this diagnosis pretty accurately without doing a lot of invasive testing, by getting a really good history, by talking to the family, by doing some basic cognitive tests, and if we can diagnose this illness early, then we're going to be much more successful in intervening with treatments that hopefully will very shortly be available to slow the progressive decline of this illness. Um, this is a, uh, a slide which shows some PET scan data from Gary Small, who used to be in Boston and now is out at UCLA. And this shows the changes in the metabolism of the brain and in blood flow that occurs over the course of the illness. So the areas that are red and yellow are signifying high levels of brain activity and metabolic activity, and the areas in blue are decreased levels. And so as the illness progresses, brain activity goes down, metabolic activity declines considerably, not unlike what you see in a child who's just starting to develop all the connections that are so important as children develop into uh, adolescents and young adults. And this is from our brain bank at McLean Hospital, but one of the primary features of the illness when you look at the brain is the shrinking that occurs, or we call that atrophy. And it occurs in a specific area of the brain early on in the illness called the hippocampus, where we store new information, but as the disease progresses, you can see it affects the entire brain. And what I don't have a slide of is the hallmark pathology of this illness, which are these sticky plaques and tangles in the brain, which are somehow involved in the disease process itself. And right now, there's a lot of clinical trial development, a lot of research trying to see, can we prevent the deposition of these plaques in the brain, or can we eliminate them once they're there? And there may actually be things that we can do, and you'll hear about that tonight, in terms of the way we take care of ourselves medically, that we um, exercise, nutrition, all those things are probably going to play a big role on the development of, of illnesses that we call dementia. 
Now, why does it take so long to make the diagnosis? One of the problems is that family members will often not recognize there's a problem until there's a crisis at hand. Oh, well, you figure mom is in her 70s or 80s, short-term memory disturbance must just be typical of aging. But that's not true. Memory problems are common with Alzheimer's disease. It's the hallmark of the illness. But what happens as we get older with our memory is it takes us longer to remember things, it's, it's, it, but we're still able to remember new things. We can still learn new pieces of information. And so staying active and, and healthy and engaged in activities that are meaningful to us can actually promote that as well. And social skills may actually be also maintained as people develop this illness. So without doing detailed assessments of whether someone knows what day it is, what time of year it is, what they had for breakfast, um, you wouldn't really know that there was a problem. Um, we also know that people with this illness, not always but often, aren't even aware that there's a problem, either because they don't want to be aware emotionally and it's too frightening to realize what's going on, or they really just lack the awareness because of the parts of the brain that are affected by the disease. And then there's a big thing about stigma and ageism, where we sort of project our own feelings about what it would be like to grow old and just don't want to deal with or recognize this problem and sort of sweep it under the rug. Um, and then finally, this is a problem which I think the medical community has to do a better job with, is come up with screening tools so that we have a series of tools that are readily available so that we can actually make this diagnosis earlier. If we do make the diagnosis earlier, right now the, pr the primary benefit is preparing for what's going to happen down the road. This illness affects the entire family. This is not an illness of an individual. This is an illness of the family. And probably the most rewarding and time-intensive work that I do clinically is working with families and helping to manage, cope with, and understand this illness and to really help the caregivers. The caregiver stress that occurs in the context of taking care of someone with, illness, with this illness leads to increasing medical problems and, and can also cause significant psychiatric issues. Also, if we recognize this disease early, we can not only intervene with the treatments that we currently have, which I'll mention in a minute, but also try to get people involved in the clinical trials that are going on now and the research studies that will hopefully offer some promise in the near future. One thing I focus on as a psychiatrist is what are the things that I can do to maximize the quality of life of somebody with Alzheimer's disease? Even though this illness will progress, that's the definition of the illness, it's a progressive problem, there are many things that drive the progression. And our goal really is about quality of life. It's about maintaining someone's independence for as long as possible. And the things outside of the big circle are the things that impact the uh, progression of this illness, from somebody who's living at home to someone who might need more care and wind up in a long-term care facility. I've never met a family member or a, or a patient who says, sure, I'm ready for the nursing home. Nobody ever says that, right? And if they did, you'd probably be worried. So what we try to do is maximize, and, and actually sometimes they probably would do better in a long-term care facility for a variety of reasons. And actually, I work in some long-term care facilities where if they weren't there, I think things would be a lot wor worse off for the patient. But most people want to maintain their independence wherever they're living. And so these things that we can actually treat, psychiatric symptoms, mood disturbance, depression, anxiety, agitation, what we call delusions, where people don't recognize family members and think they're somebody else. This creates a lot of agitation. These are symptoms we can actually treat and manage and sometimes even prevent and save a lot of the stress that the caregivers are, are under. And finally, just to say a little bit about treatment, the goal of treatment currently is really about maximizing independence and improving quality of life. And I bet you that's a theme you'll hear constantly throughout the evening. And what we want to do now with the current treatments that we have that are available, medications that change chemical functioning in the brain, change acetylcholine levels in the brain, or mo modulate the glutamate receptor, these are medications that are symptomatic treatments only. They don't treat the underlying biology of the illness. They treat some of the late stage effects of the illness. But with these treatments, what we see is a modest improvement or a slowing of the decline in memory loss, in day-to-day -day functioning, and some people have seen in certain studies an actual improvement in some of the behavioral symptoms. So that's our goal in terms of the treatments that we currently have. There's a lot of research going on right now. There's frankly not enough research going on right now in the area of aging. And maybe that's one of the messages we want to get across tonight is that we need a lot of public advocacy to talk about um, the, the lack of funding really at a federal level regarding research in aging across the board. 
And then finally, uh, the caring for the caregiver issue, I think, um, is a really important point. We could probably spend another uh, hour and a half session at some point, maybe another year, talking about this issue um, on its own. So um, that's my brief talk. Uh, my, my job tonight is to, to uh, introduce our two speakers and then to um, uh, moderate um, a question and answer session at the end. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move right along here and introduce my colleague, Dr. Bludow, who you heard a little bit about. Um, Dr. Bludow is actually from Germany and educated in England. He received his medical degree from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and completed his postgraduate training in the United States. He's a board certified Harvard Fellowship trained geriatrician and that is his, oh, I won't say anything about that picture. You'll hear about that picture. <laughs> I don't know what to say, Jurgen. Uh, Dr. Dr. Bluto, as you know, is the Director of Geriatric Services at the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, in their Division of Aging and an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And importantly, he recently authored a new book called Aging But Never Old, a book that helps uh, the community and the public understand what true geriatric care is. He's also the co-author of Alzheimer's Disease, uh, a biography of disease, which is a broad overview of the condition. Uh, Dr. Bludow speaks regularly at uh, local, national, and international conferences and will be speaking to us tonight about senior care, do we really need it? Dr. Bludow. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, this is odd. I'd like to uh, always walk around. I just want to make sure that I can forward this. Uh, um, how do I? Oh, oh, there, yes. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm a geriatrician, somebody you don't uh, find uh, a lot around. Well, I should say in the Boston area, there are several of us, and we're blessed here. But once you uh, go outside of Worcester or South, uh, you don't find geriatricians. Geriatricians, who are we? What are we? We're internist family practitioners who have an extra one or sometimes two years of fellowship training. And we see patients 65 and older. We see these patients. Elderly, older, older adults, seniors, retirees. I'm not quite sure what's PC. It changes every year. But what we do know is that these people make up 13 plus percent of the US population at the moment. And the fastest growing segment of the US population is the 85 and older. So they're all around. We just don't know how to call them, and we don't have physicians, enough physicians, who can take care of them. We also have a lot of lack of knowledge of how to take care of them among internist family practitioners. That's not putting them down by all means, but it's just, just different to look after or to take care of an older person uh, compared to a younger person. And they're everywhere, as I said. Look, 31% plus, over a third of all the acute care hospital admissions are in people or in are patients who are 65 and older, geriatric patients. And ambulatory visits, the majority almost, are made or in, in, in private practice, patient, physicians see a lot of older people. So there is a disconnect here. We have them, we don't know how to take care of them. And Again, we are blessed here in the Boston area, but not so once you leave in other parts of the country. Is there really a, uh, is this immortality? Are we going to live to 150? What is happening? Why are we talking about this? Um, this is uh, out of, uh, obviously, the New York Times Magazine. I guess it's uh, actually still in the 20th century there. Um, what has happened? Well, let me explain. Over the last 100 years, we have increased life expectancy. Not lifespan, but life expectancy. So a baby born in uh, 19, 1911, a baby girl, maybe 49.5 years, she was expected at least to live. Today, a baby girl would live over 80 years. That's good. Um, in Japan, 
in Taiwan, other countries, it's already mid 80s, 85. So we're doing well, but we're not the only country, and there are other countries who do a better job. Why? Let's leave that for another discussion. <laughs> um, so we've, we've increased life expectancy, lots of reasons, good care, good, uh, good uh, um, medical care, water, sanitation, antibiotics, medications, uh, education, good civilization, democracies. I mean, there's, there's multiple reasons for this. What has also happened, though, is that at this, over this last 100 years, we have taken morbidity, disease, and mortality, death, and have literally pushed it to the extremes of life. So it is unusual to find people, patients, people die in their 40s, 20s, 50s. Yes, it happens. It's tragic, accidents, cancer, homicide, God knows what, dreadful things. But if you look at the obituaries, it's all older people. We have pushed death and, and, and disease towards the end of life. And what have we created? Well, we've created sort of chronic care. We've created a healthcare system. We have lots of elderly, older people with chronic care. We've made disease chronic quickly. If it was 1911 and I stood in front of you, suddenly felt chest pain, had an MI, I'd probably be dead uh, within the hour if that's even, so I might be dead right there and then. If this happens now, I hope somebody calls 911. I would like to go to the Brigham, um, but the ch <laughs> Sorry, had to say that. Uh, but I, the, the point is, I will probably survive if it wasn't the LAD. If I don't survive, my children will have a good college fund. If I do survive, they won't go to college. But the, the, what, what happens is, I would become, as of tonight, a chronic care, a chronic cardiac patient. Four, five medications, lots of visit to the cardiologist, uh, maybe even the psychiatrist. Uh, I would have all sorts of tests over the next years and back and forth. So I, I've, we've made heart disease chronic. Same with kidney disease. People would die 100 years ago, now I'd be on dialysis. I hope you get the point. It leaves us with older, patients who have chronic diseases, and that's where our healthcare system just falls apart. We are good in treating acute disease, stroke, heart attack. We're not good in taking care of chronic diseases, which is a very different way, and I think that's part of the problem we have. So, what makes an older person different? Why are there geriatricians? Why are we failing these people? I wish this was a patient of mine. It's not, sorry. What makes these people different? Is an 80-year-old person just like a 50-year-old, but happens to be lucky and be 30, year old, 30 years older? No, it's not. They're very different, and here's why. There's this concept of heterogeneity. Take 10, 40-year-old people standing in front of you. From a medical point of view, men, women, they all look the same. No chronic medications, no functional decline, no cognitive decline. They're all active, and they probably don't even have a primary care physician because they can't find one. <laughs> Take 10 80-year-old patients. Jim, very active. Jim was a patient. Very active, jet-setting between Boston and Fort Lauderdale, um, uh, playing golf. Uh, when the weather was cold up here, he was down there. Uh, over here, many elderly men and women in wheelchairs, nursing homes, dementia, needing care for whatever chronic disease they have, 24 hours. People with 5, 10, 15 medications, people with walkers, canes, people who have bad arthritis, can barely walk, Parkinson's disease, degrees of dementia, all sorts of dementia. You get the point. Heterogeneity. So the first thing, we can't have sort of a cookbook medicine. We're going to do this for the 80s, this for the 70s, this for the 60s, this for the 40s. It is individualized care. Our healthcare system doesn't do well with that. Homeostenosis, not a mis misspelling. Homeostenosis, narrowing of intern reserves of an older person. Jim, Jim flew back. This is the real story. Flew back from Fort Lauderdale. Must have picked up some nasty virus. 
uh, was vomiting, was dehydrated, fell in his room, fractured his hip. Yes, poor man. And who was fit and on the golf course a week, ago, a week before uh, in the hospital, eventually nursing home. And he died within sort of a three month period. He had a heart attack somewhere along the line. His internal reserves are very narrow. If I had that same virus, I'd be sick. I could be in bed, I could miss some clinics. Yes, I even would have to cancel clinics. Uh, but it's unlikely that I would be syncopal, that I would fall, collapse, that I would become confused, that my kidneys would shut down, that I would have a heart attack. I, at least I don't hope so. Uh, I, younger people have good sort of reserves. Older people, not so. So we have to be careful, and we have to be careful in treating them, because a lot of them have lots of comorbidities. If you treat one disease, you may make another one worse. So you have to be a little careful. No cookbook medicine. Individualized care, our healthcare system doesn't do well with that. Disease presentation, talked about heart disease, the crushing chest pain, the typical radiation, the, the feeling of impending doom, the nausea and vomiting. All of that is sort of what we learn in medical school as the classic uh, sort of cardiac disease, heart attack. Or what about the hacking cough, the high temperature, the feeling that you can't just get enough breath, uh, that you're really tired. And if you take an x-ray, there it is, this huge pneumonia, and you have a white cell count, which is out of this room, whatever. It's, it's classic. In an older person, what do you get? No chest pain. Confusion, not feeling well, short of breath, um, falling not sleeping well, poor appetite. People with a pneumonia, no cough, not even a fever. You look at the, their blood work and it looks normal. You take the x-ray, you see the big fat pneumonia. Very different presentation. And as a result of that, you have to be aware of that. So an older person comes and says, I don't feel well. I, or the caregiver says, he's not the same. Something isn't right, he doesn't sleep as well, he doesn't eat. You can look at Harrison's textbook of medicine, and you won't find that presenting symptom. And you get, well, he's 80, what do you want? I mean, I don't feel good sometimes. I didn't sleep, I was awake, I was cold, and whatever. Wrong answer. The thing to do is, this could be a disease presenting itself differently in an older person. You see, it's a very different way of taking care of these people. Oops. So, the point here is, we have lots of elderly people with diseases which present themselves differently. We have a healthcare system which is not very good at taking care of uh, these people. We have lots of physicians who don't have the knowledge or don't get the knowledge uh, of how to take care of these patients. So no wonder we end up with not always the best care for the elderly, and we hope that this will change in the future. I mean, Harvard Medical Schools and other medical schools are trying to introduce the concept, but it's slow in coming, and uh, we can just hope that uh, maybe the baby boomers will make a difference and ask for better care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bludow. All right, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Sinclair. Dr. Sinclair is a professor at Harvard Medical School in the Department of Pathology and Genetics, and as you heard, the co-director of the Paul Glenn Laboratories for the Biological Mechanisms of Aging. He has worked um, at MIT in the past, co-discovering a cause of aging for yeast and the role of a specific um, a compound called SIR2 in genetic changes. He came to Harvard Medical School in 1999 and has been primarily focused on understanding the role of sirtuins in disease and aging. Dr. Sinclair is the co-chief editor of the journal Aging and has received numerous national and international awards. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sinclair. everyone. Um, can you hear me okay up there, way up in the, the nosebleed area? 
Uh, you may, if you have trouble with my accent, think Crocodile Dundee. I'm from Australia originally. Um, so thank you for coming. I know we, we all have very busy lives these days, so I really appreciate spending uh, uh, a couple of hours of your, your life. Uh, we only get about 10,000 days, and so thanks for spending part of one of those with us. Um, I hope that it's worth it, um, and thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, maybe we could get started on, on uh, the first slide. Okay, uh, so I have disclosures. Um, but what I wanna really talk about today is uh, to tell you about something that's been quite amazing to witness uh, in, in my, my 70 year long lifespan. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, I do look young, but I'm not, 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 that, not that good. So the, but, the, but seriously, the, the last 20 years has been a, an amazing uh, time for aging research. Um, there hasn't just been developments in, in medicine and medical devices which have helped extend lifespan. Uh, what's coming along the, the pipeline is a radical change in how we understand why we age and how we age, and more importantly, how we might do something about it. And the research that I'm telling you about today is really I'm standing on the shoulders and standing side by side with, with a number of colleagues I'll tell you about. Um, but this has been a, a group of really, a core group of about 25, 30 maverick scientists most of them are actually here in Boston um, or in other cities on the coast. There are some very good scientists uh, in the middle of the country, but primarily the U.S. is leading in the way in the understanding of the control of aging at the genetic level. Um, and I'm going to tell you also about how we may develop one day drugs that could intervene and not just slow down the aging process, but be used to turn on our body's natural defenses against aging itself. And those same medicines could be used to treat diseases that many of us will get, and certainly our parents and our grandparents have already um, gotten. And so the, the medicines really, what I'm here to tell you about is that these medicines are not about keeping old people uh, alive for longer. It's really about keeping people uh, alive during their 50s and 60s when they're more susceptible to, uh, getting more susceptible to heart attacks and cancer, um, and getting them getting people through that danger zone and keeping them healthy until their 70s, 80s, and 90s. Now, maybe one day we'll end up uh, you know, with 100-year-olds playing tennis on a regular basis, but that's not the goal here. What we do here at Harvard Medical School, in my lab in particular, we're focused on finding small molecules or drugs that will one day treat diseases that uh, we commonly uh, die from. Uh, I want to celebrate uh, this lady. Uh, if you don't know about her, her name is uh, Jean Comment. She died um, in 1997. She's the longest lived human. She actually made it to 122. Okay, it's really quite amazing. She was uh, very active. I th the stories go on. Uh, I believe she smoked until she was uh, nearly 100. So she, <laughs> she had a great sense of humor too. She, she spoke to a young reporter and the reporter said, uh, hopefully I'll see you next year. And she said, I don't see why not. You, you look pretty healthy to me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she also claimed that to have only one wrinkle and she was sitting on it. But <laughs> so she, so th this is what we, I think we should all aspire to. Clearly when she was, even in her 80s and 90s, she was as healthy as probably a, a 50 or a 60 year old. And that would be the goal here. Um, this is closer to home. This, uh, the lady on the right here is my grandmother. Um, and her sister is on the left. They uh, escaped uh, Hungary in 1956, emigrated to Australia, uh, where they lived out their lives. Um, my grandmother on the right, her name is Vera, and uh, I called her Vera her whole life, and I say that because she was very active, always wanted to stay young, uh, didn't even want me to call her grandma or granny, uh, and, uh, and just treated, I treated her like, uh, like a, I know, an, an older sibling, actually. Uh, she was born in, in 1923, and, uh, and you can see she didn't live the healthiest of lives. Uh, she, she smoked, she drank, she ate. Uh, and so I come from a family that uh, has, at least for the past four generations, totally abused themselves. <laughs> so I don't know how long I'm going to live. I, I, uh, I'm trying to be healthier than they did. Uh, but the, what I'm, I'm looking forward to is to being able, able to understand what is the genetic basis of longevity. So while we're on that topic, 
Um, I'm going to have ask for a bit of audience participation. How many of you know somebody who seems to look or behave younger than their actual years? Right. So keep your hand up if you know someone who looks like they're older than they should. Yeah. So the point is, you can put your hands down. That, that's very clear. Most of you raised your hands, so we can already tell just from our colleagues and friends and family that there are different rates of aging. And it's clearly not just the environment. I mean, you, we all know people who are obese or smoke, the, the example on the slide earlier, who just seemingly they defy their lifestyle. Now, this is not an excuse to go smoke cigars, of course, but, but we know people who have seemingly great genes. And the goal of the research here is to find out what are those genes and enhance those pathways to bring uh, you know, the normal people, myself included, up to the level of, say, a Jian, Jian Kalmain, or at least get us to an, uh, a type of physiology where uh, we are like the people who can eat whatever they want and they stay healthy. The other reason for hope about being able to control aging is this phenomenon that has been studied for over 70 years now, and this is this diet known as calorie restriction. Uh, this has been applied to many different species in the lab. It's worked on everything from a yeast to a fish and a spider, um, dogs. This is a study in monkeys that uh, received a fair amount of press uh, about a couple of years ago. And this is from uh, Richard Weindruck's lab at University of Wisconsin. And, uh, this is a very long experiment. It's been going for over 15 years, and he's been restricting the calories um, of the monkeys on, example, is on the left. Uh, this monkey is about the same age as the one on the right, but uh, has been on a, a diet where the monkey is eating about 30% less than the monkey on the right. And, um, and we know that this works in many species. It seems to slow down the pace of aging quite dramatically. Uh, diseases, even in these monkeys, such as cancer and heart disease, were nearly eliminated. Um, and the idea is that perhaps we could understand what's going on in these animals. What, what are the pathways that the genetic pathways that underlie this process. And if we could get a handle on those processes, maybe we could give the benefits of these diets um, and maybe of exercise as well um, without having to expect someone who's just come in from, an, from an, an accident, had a stroke, or expect someone who's frail and elderly to go on such a diet. That's just not going to work. So we need to make this druggable. And I'm going to tell you about how we're doing that. Some people are not waiting for the drug. Um, there are, is a calorie restriction society. Uh, the, these are friends of mine. They visited the lab. The man on the left is, left is Brian Delaney. He's the president of the society. Great guy. He's been restricting for many, many years. Um, also on, shown on, uh, in this picture is Meredith McLaughlin and her husband, Paul. Uh, they've been restricting for over a decade now, and they very carefully watch their blood glucose levels and try to keep their blood sugar levels very low. Uh, I tried this for about a week, and <laughs> this is not for me, right? This is, it, this is what I would call very uh, painful hunger. Constantly, I couldn't think about anything else but hunger. And, but I have huge respect for people who can do this. I hear that there are at least 1,000 people who are doing this, and I think they will be healthier. They may not live longer. We don't know that yet. But certainly based on the studies that have been published, people who do this diet have the biochemical profile of the animals that have lived longer in studies. Uh, so what do we do? And if we cannot uh, do this ourselves, well, we need to find what's going on. And the first thing I need to tell you about before I get into the molecular work is that we now have a completely different view of aging than we did before 1990. So when you were in high school, you might have had a conversation about aging. Someone might have said, oh, you only get a certain number of heartbeats. That's rubbish. Or, oh, it's about your metabolic rate. That's rubbish. Uh, it is related to metabolism, but there's no inbuilt clock. What we now believe, actually, is that we don't just wear out, um, as you know, this analogy of a car um, is showing. Aging is not just wear and tear. We actually now understand that what determines our pace of aging is due to defense mechanisms that can either be activated or turned off. You can activate them by restricting how much you eat or exercising. We can turn them off by overeating and becoming obese or sitting and watching TV constantly. And uh, this is where I need to give credit to just some of the, the superstars in this field. Um, across the river, 
can see this pointer, that's Leonard Gorenti. I trained with him uh, as a postdoc end of last century. Uh, this is Gary Rovkin, he's also here at Harvard. These are really some of the people that I call these the, the renegade band of scientists who have come out and said, you know what, there are genes that can actually slow down aging, and we think we know what they are. And these pre predominantly are studies in simple organisms like yeast cells and worms uh, and fruit flies. And thanks to that work, we now appreciate that we don't just wear out, we actually have these defenses that we can activate by uh, either diet or exercise. And now we're developing the tools to chemically activate them as well. And that's what these drugs of the future may do. Um, so here's a, a yeast cell. I took this photo a number of years ago. This is an old yeast cell. We, you can see that it's, it's yellow, which means it's acidic and it's, it's big and bloated. It's very similar to what happens to ourselves. Um, now, what I did with Leonard Garenti uh, back in the late 1990s was to figure out why these cells get old. It turns out their chromosomes get tangled and messed up and they choke on their own DNA. But what this led to was a remarkable finding in that lab uh, that there's a particular set of genes that controls the aging process in these baker's yeast cells. And uh, what we call, we call these genes is the sirtuins. Okay, and we actually have seven of these genes in our body and uh, their names are SIRT1 through to SIRT7. And uh, they are very similar to this original yeast gene that uh, the lab that I was in showed could extend the lifespan of yeast cells. Um, ostensibly by mimicking this diet of calorie restriction. We know that because if you delete the SIRT2 SIR2 gene from the yeast cell and you calorie restrict that yeast cell, uh, that largely blocks the effect of the diet. But there's been a lot of research since on these genes. They seem to be very uh, helpful to keep us uh, active and healthy in, in, our, in our life. Most of this work, I should give a disclaimer, is based on animal experiments that, where we're trying to make the, the mice healthier for longer. And we don't yet know for sure if this is related to humans, but I'll show you that there is some evidence. Uh, what do sirtuins do? Well, see this traffic cop in, in this... Uh, this traffic jam. This is what the sirtuins are doing in your body right now. They're, they're directing the traffic. They're saying, oh, there's a problem over with the DNA. Go that way. Go fix that. Or, uh, uh, gosh, you've just eaten a meal. You want to store that energy. Or, oh, gosh, you're, you're n you haven't eaten since uh, dinner last night. You should start burning that fat. And they're really like a traffic cop telling other proteins in the cell what to do. And they do that by clipping off little chemical tags off other proteins, and they go off and do their job. So think of this, uh, these genes as the, the genes that make a protein that control how your body defenses are mobilized. And if you eat a large hamburger and get obese, then they do a very poor job, and there aren't as many traffic cops in your body. Um, so this is the a description of what actually one of these genes does. This is the SIRT1 gene which is most well understood. And uh, really, you, what I want you to take away from this is that SIRT1 is known to protect many different parts of your body, or at least in, in animal studies. Uh, we can uh, slow down Alzheimer's in mice and protect against a heart attack. Uh, we can reduce the, the, the obesity. This is white adipose tissue here. Um, increase the secretion of insulin to get rid of blood sugar in your blood. And one of the most amazing effects is actually that this gene controls how your muscles uh, burn energy and how much energy they can make. And I'll show you later, we can make molecules that can make m mice run twice as far on a treadmill without ever having exercised before. What we think is going on is that this gene is very ancient. It's been around for the last billion years. We find these genes in all living life forms on the planet. And we think that they first arose to keep organisms alive during times of adversity that threatened the organism's survival. And that's why when we exercise and get damaged muscles or we eat uh, very little, our body turns on these genes um, and the body goes into a defensive mode. These are some of the, the, the traffic proteins that go off and do the jobs. And they have fancy names, but essentially uh, they go off and, and do particular jobs in the cell like repairing DNA, burning fat, or protecting nerve cells in the brain from dying. It also, this gene, I was recently discovered by an, uh, a number of labs, is that it's in, this gene is central to the body's natural clock. 
and it's cycling during the day. And I thought that this was really worth pointing out because here we have a gene that's not only central, we believe, to controlling our health and aging, but it even is active during the day and the nighttime, controlling when we start getting ready for a meal and when we burn fat and possibly even <laughs> when we experience jet lag. Um, this is a close-up view of what a sirtuin protein is. So the gene makes the protein. Here's a, a picture of what one looks like. So this is a, a sirtuin protein. And so the traffic cop works by clipping chemical groups off. And so if you zoom up into the, the mouth of the clip, uh, you can see just over here on the right that the mouth, this is an enzyme that actually clips off these little groups of proteins. And when it does that, the protein now becomes more active and more defensive. Um, so this is a little machine. It's re a very beautiful machine. It actually responds to how much energy your body is taking in. If your body doesn't have much energy, you haven't eaten, the protein will be super active, like a, a munching Pac-Man. Uh, if you're overweight, you have a lot of sugar in your blood, it'll slow down, and it can sense that environment. Um, so a number of years ago, we thought, gosh, it would be great if we could uh, turn off or turn on these genes. We could have great tools. Maybe one day we could even make a drug. And we teamed up with a, a company called Biomol in Pennsylvania. And together we found a, a set of, pro of small molecules. These are little chemicals that we could demonstrate in test tubes could activate this enzyme so that it would, instead of it slowly chomping, thanks to our you know, excessive diet, we could give theoretically these small molecules, say in a pill, um, and now the enzyme would behave as though we were calorie restricted or, or we'd been exercising. That was the theory. Uh, we didn't know what to expect. We, we just randomly looked through sets of chemicals. Uh, at Harvard, we have hundreds of thousands of these. And we came up with a set of about 20 or so molecules that could activate this enzyme, turn it on. The one that got all the media um, was this one, resveratrol. You may have heard of it. It's found in red wine in small amounts, uh, about a milligram in a glass. Um, don't believe that you can get enough resveratrol from red wine. You'd need to drink about a thousand glasses a day, which I don't recommend. <laughs> uh, now, there's a misconception that we've been studying red wine. That's not the case. We, this is a pure chemical. We give it in its pure form, even a synthetic version. Uh, but it's very interesting. We think that this may be one of the components of red wine that, that impart the health benefits, not the whole story, of course. But we use this as a tool to understand what could happen when you give an activator of sirtuins to organisms. And what's shown here is that m time after time when we gave the molecules to yeast cells or worms or flies, and another group in Italy gave resveratrol to fish in just in the fish food, they lived longer. And look at this, in this vertebrate species, species almost 60% longer lifespan, uh, which I believe is the, the record for a vertebrate species. And in the cases where we could test, we were able to remove the gene that we believe is the target, or one of the targets, the sirtuin gene. And when we deleted the sirtuin gene, um, the effect went away. So in other words, it requires the sirtuin gene. And I'm gonna show you a bit of data in mice now. Now, we've been collaborating with the National Institutes of Health, Rafa de Cabo's lab, to uh, test whether resveratrol has any health benefits in a mouse. And uh, so I'll tell you some of those results. Um, what we did also was we realized that the average mouse does not eat an American diet. <laughs> uh, far from it. And so we also fed the mice uh, a high fat diet. 60% of their calories come from fat. And we either left out resveratrol or we added resveratrol to the diet. And uh, this is just to remind me that, to tell you that if nothing else, if we're able to tackle the obesity problem in this country and other Western countries, uh, this research will be worth it. This is a plague of epidemic proportions coming. Okay, so here are the mice. Well, we had 500 mice. This is uh, an example of what the mice looked like. The mice on, on the standard mouse chow, they don't get typically fat on the left. But the mice on the high calorie Western diet did get fat. And then you can see the resveratrol didn't change how fat the mice were. They were still fat. Now, we were quite depressed when we saw this finding. We thought, oh my goodness, nothing's happening. But when Rafa and I started to look inside these animals, we were shocked. What we saw, um, and eventually we went down to the genetic level, 
even looking at how genes are turned on and off, what we saw was that these mice, um, even though they were fat, their organs, rest of their body, did not realize that they were fat. Their arteries were clean. Their hearts were strong. Uh, their muscles were strong. They had very little inflammation, which is caused by obesity. Um, and time after time, when we looked at their organs, it was as though their bodies didn't realize that they were fat. And we think that part of this is due to these anti-inflammatory effects of resveratrol. And uh, one of the best effects, actually, uh, is shown in, in this movie that I'll show you. This actually comes from a, another lab. This was uh, in France at the time, Johann Ulrichs's lab, fed resveratrol to mice and uh, had a look at what happened to their muscles. And what he found was that mice on resveratrol were super fit. And uh, you might want to take a guess which is the mouse on resveratrol. <laughs> Turns out it's the one on the right. And when you do this many times, the average distance that is run before the mice get tired is twice as long if you're on a diet of resveratrol, independent of how fat you are. And uh, Johan showed that the muscles of these mice were packed full of the energy producing parts of the cell, the mitochondria. So these mice were essentially little Lance Armstrongs, but they'd never been training, so that was quite shocking. So this was, as far as I'm aware, the first demonstration that you could, with a drug, induce the effects of exercise. Um, I'm going to show you a bit, of, a bit of data from my lab. Now, you don't need to look at all these names and, and numbers, but just focus in on the blue and the orange bars, okay? This is data that I show other scientists. We haven't published it yet, but it's really quite striking. What we've done is we've generated a mouse here at Harvard where just by feeding a drug, a, s a small chemical in the food of the mice, we can delete the sirtuin gene from the mouse. Okay, so we can grow it, make the mice live normally, and then it's three months of age, get rid of the gene. And now when we've done that, we can do that experiment again with resveratrol and ask, are any of the effects of resveratrol, are any of these benefits uh, lost when you get rid of this particular one gene? And the answer, I think you can see already, is absolutely this gene is required for the effects of resveratrol. These are different genes that uh, we can look at in the muscle of these mice. And the blue is how much these genes are boosted by resveratrol. You can see compared to the, the first bar, we've got in some cases a doubling of the, the genes that are switched on, but it doesn't happen in the mouse that doesn't have the gene shown in orange. So that's very important for us scientists because now we can get a handle on how is this molecule actually working in a living organism. And that's of great uh, importance also for the development of better molecules that can turn on this pathway. So speaking of which, this was a paper that got a lot of attention. It's controversial. Um, and we can talk about that later. But essentially what this was, was a paper that came out for a, from a company that was spun out of Harvard Medical School. I was involved, of course. This is a company, company called Sertris. And their goal was to make better molecules than resveratrol, synthetic molecules. Um, and they became very good at it. In fact, here are examples of three different molecules that they developed. These are some of the best out of 4,000 that they synthesized by hand. And these were given to mice, and they had the same effects as resver resveratrol. The mice were, um, had less diabetes, they could run further, they were metabolically active. Um, and in fact, we have data that we're going to publish on showing that at least two of these molecules can extend the lifespan of these obese mice. And we saw that also with resveratrol. So we can recapitulate the effects of res resveratrol, but with a synthetic molecule that is much more potent, we believe. And we're making great inroads in understanding how these molecules actually turn on this Pac-Man enzyme. We believe that it's binding and sticking to the enzyme and sitting on its back and making it chomp faster. Um, this is a paper that came out um, describing that mechanism. And I, I show this for perhaps some of the people on online who are watching this movie that uh, you might want to go and research how this, we believe this mechanism occurs. And you can see in this mouth the chomping mechanism and one of these drugs in pink, how it actually works. Um, of course, not everyone agrees. Some people don't believe that these molecules work by activating these enzymes. And that's, of course, why we've gone to the effort of making a mouse that lacks the gene. Um, 
So speaking of genes, and I'm just going to wrap up now talking about what I think the future is for aging research and where we're going with this. Okay, so this is, of course, a DNA molecule. We are getting very good as scientists at reading the genetic code. When we do this and we look at the variants of the sirtuin genes, we're turning up variants in these genes that associate with improved health and longevity. And these are three examples of the papers that have come out recently. So it may turn out that depending on what we inherit from our parents in this gene and, and others, uh, we can actually predict how susceptible we will be to diseases and what disease we should particularly look out for. You can already do this test if you'd like in this country. Some countries don't allow it, but uh, I don't believe Australia allows it. But in the US, you can have your, uh, not your whole genome sequence, but you can look at variants of 400, 400,000 variants of your genes. And this is a company, 23andMe. Uh, I'm not involved, but I'm a big fan. And this is my son, Benjamin, who uh, is spitting into a tube and having his DNA tested. And uh, I've had my whole family done uh, and my parents and my wife, and I'm alarmingly related to my wife, actually. Uh, not <laughs> uh, she's from Germany, turns out we're related to Ashkenazi Jews, but that's another story. Uh, but you'd learn a lot of fun things, but also we can now see what are the genes like that I'm passing on to my offspring. And so I, I have the, a mutation in the cystic fibrosis gene, for example, and I want to know, do my kids inherit that? But also we can look at longevity genes like SIRT1. So what is the cost per genome? Well, you may have seen this in the media. It's really one of the most remarkable changes in technology uh, that probably has happened in the history of humans, and that is the, the cost of it determining the entire genetic sequence of your body. And it's, it's going much faster than, than computer technology, as you can see with this slide here. So it's gone from about $100 million. Soon it'll be about $2,000 to look at your entire genome. So when that happens, I think we might be able to go home with a, a newborn child with a, a CD-ROM, or they'll probably email you the genome. <laughs> uh, deciphering what that means is, is going to take a bit longer. Um, and so I want to end by thanking you for coming and also uh, ending on a bright note. This is my grandmother, Vera. She's still going strong despite having abused her body. And uh, we now have five generations in the Sinclair family, and I hope that we can find drugs that will allow at least five generations to, to see each other, meet each other, and learn from each other. Thanks again for coming. <laughs>